But now we come to the patients, which are really a very, very, very important uh, stakeholder here. And here we have with us Birte Biskoff-Holm. Um, Birte has been a volunteer uh, advocate for people with rare diseases and their families since her son was born in 1983 with a rare disorder, osteogenesis imperfecta. So she has a long history of active participation and passionate participation in patient organizations. Uh, and she has had very, a lot of high-level appointments in, in patient organizations. She is, among other things, uh, the co-founder of the Danish Alliance for Rare Diseases, Patients Organizations, um, uh, Rare Diseases Denmark, and uh, uh, Holm was, um, Birte was elected uh, uh, president since uh, 2009 of this organization. Birte is also currently a member of the board of the European Alliance of Rare Disease, Patient Organization, Aurodus, Rare Diseases Europe. Aurodus is a non-governmental patient-driven alliance of patient organizations representing 792 rare diseases patient organizations in 69 countries. And we met also in, at Kors, which is our center for uh, regulatory sciences here at the U University of Copenhagen, where we both sit in the scientific advisory committee. So I'm very happy to have you with us. The stage is yours, Peter. Yes, thank you for uh, inviting me to this um, this conference. Um, <clears throat> it's um, even though I have been um, a volunteer patient advocate for more than 30 years, <clears throat> this is uh, a bit new audience for me. Um, it's not the same audience that I normally speak to. <clears throat> the room is not new for me as I took my law degree here in Copenhagen in 1973, and at that time we were still in these old buildings. Um, <clears throat> as Timo said, um, I'm one of the founding mothers um, of the Danish Alliance for Rare Diseases, actually the oldest one in Europe. Um, but um, I will not talk um, about the state of the art in Denmark. I will talk about how we, on a European level, see the situation. Um, actually, what does um, patient ask for? We ask for life-saving, life-improving treatments, sometimes available but we need them to be affordable for national healthcare systems. We need a sustainable and predictable environment, and most importantly, patients must be able to access them the wrong way. So, is that too much to ask for? Um, we have friends that think that it's not too much to ask for. If we see in the EU regulation on orphan medicinal products, we can see the sentence, patients suffering from rare conditions should be entitled to the same quality of treatment as other patients. And um, we can also find something about the rare diseases in the, the council uh, recommendation from June 2009 in the fields of rare diseases. And again, it's underlined from the European perspective that these principles of good quality care, equity, and solidarity are of paramount importance for patients with rare diseases. This is just some of the sentences. I could, f could find um, more um, uh, about the same um, uh, um, the, the same thinking. This is, um, this is a position paper made by Eurodis, the European Alliance for Rare Disease, um, Rare Disease Organizations. It's from uh, January 2018. Uh, uh, um, it has um, been on the way for a year. It was uh, presented at a conference a year ago in February 2017. And it has been discussed, 
changed um, um, a lot of um, stakeholders has been invited to discuss this paper and now it's on the table. It's um, quite a position paper, 66 pages, and uh, the rest of my presentation, or almost the rest of my presentation, will be from this, um, this paper. See, the European regulatory framework is important. The rare disease therapies um, requires the right regulatory, economic, and political ecosystem to ensure the investments are done in this field. Um, we still believe that it would not otherwise be done. And we think that the current European regulatory framework has brought enormous benefits to the rare disease community in terms of the number of orphan designations and indications. Let's take a look at the figures. Uh, it should be um, the most um, uh, new figures from February 2018, but it changed every month. That's um, the meeting of the, in, in um, uh, the committee of for medicinal products um, and other committees uh, take their decisions. We have um, 1,988 orphan designations and uh, to date 145 authorized orphan medicinal products. The system works in the way that um, there might be more than one condition, one indication for each um, authorized orphan medicinal product or orphan uh, disease. So we actually have 159 um, products uh, or authorized indication that has uh, an orphan designation in it and 57 to be used in children. Today, there are 102 um, products with market authorization and orphan status still um, because uh, some of the, of the authorized products have lost their uh, market authority, market um, exclusivity. So, we think that um, the regulation continues to be a success, fulfilling its primary purpose to attract investments to development of these therapies. It is a genuine success and one that should be celebrated proudly by all. But if a therapy is approved but does not reach those who need it, it has failed its primary purpose. And um, as I'm between researchers, I have put in some references um, to what I'm saying. Um, and this is a um, result of a um, survey made by um, a rare barometer survey that is um, a survey that we are doing from time to time through Eurodis. We talk a lot about the pricing issue as a barrier for rare disease patients to actually um, get access to, uh, to treatments. We know that healthcare systems have found themselves in a new tremendous pressure because of arrival of very innovative medicines for widespread conditions at unprecedented high prices. So we are not very surprised that orphan drug has come under renewed scrutiny. And even that question has arised as to whether it's more fair and just to cater for the needs of the very few or to those 
of the many. But we have some facts to get right. Um, it's a fallacy to infer from a well, few well-identified cases that the prices of all, of all of the medicines are questionable and that all of the medicines are contributing to undermine the sustainability of our ailing health system. And here again, a reference from our position paper of uh, the prices that we can find. It's actually based on, it's based on data. We also know that uh, orphan medicines continue to represent overall an extremely small fraction of the pharmaceutical budgets of the EU member states. We have figures um, showing that uh, um, it lies below 5% of the total pharmaceutical expenditure on average for we, from um, European member states. You can also here find uh, the references on page 15 um, on the breaking the assets deadlock to leave no one behind uh, the name of the position paper that can be find, found on the website of uh, Eurodis. So often medicines framed as a perfect culprit. Of course, we acknowledge that um, some high price by default policies of certain individual companies has um, actually widely um, or earned often medicine matters a widely negative reputation. We know that. And uh, also here you can find on the page eight in the position paper, the names of some of the most prominent um, um, companies that we think um, has done this. Three issues with the most impacts, in our view. An unsustainable economic model that fuels mistrust between payers and companies. Because of uh, the small numbers, the complexity of the diseases, higher uncertainty. And for the second, a vast disconnection between the value of a product and the price claimed. The point is that uh, this is uh, a very expensive per person, maybe not for the budget, but uh, normally we look at the person. Or it's not seen representing sufficient value for healthcare system. And the third one, the cost of developing new therapies is too high. Um, estimated at US dollar at 2.6 billion. You can also see the references um, in the position paper. So is the orphan regulation then the problem? And the question is, is it fair to describe orphan drug as the crux of the problem and um, to be assimilated with a probable last straw that will break the camel's back? And let our already tense national healthcare system budgets to complete, complete bankruptcy. We believe that um, such a claim is largely exaggerated and fails to reflect the reality we are observing daily. But anyway, anyhow, we have recently noticed a marked increase in the number of negative comments 
all interpretations directed at the EU orphan drug regulation and at certain of its provision with regard to the EU market exclusivity. So um, we need to uh, challenge some of the, the common, common misperceptions about orphan drugs. Yes, we need to attract investments for, uh, for research and development for rare diseases. But no, financing orphan drug for rare and ultra rare disease is still far from being an easy or obvious business choice. And no, obtaining an orphan drug status in Europe is not easy, it's not easy to maintain, and it's not meant to last forever. And just to remind us that an orphan drug um, status in Europe is not the same as an orphan drug status in the US. No, EU market activity enshrined in the regulation is not a monopoly. No, exclusivity does not automatically and uninvocally lead to high prices. No, the X factor pr factory price is not what payers actually end up paying. So we, we actually believe that the persisting fragmentation of Euro's market is actually um, the most, one of the most significant um, um, weaknesses. And this is what we think is um, needed to overcoming the weaknesses of the current model. It's up to the member states to actually solve these uh, problems. The last thing I would like to, um, to comment is that um, um, the 26th workshop of your orders down table of companies has just had the meeting in uh, February um, with um, um, the theme, rare diseases, do we get what we intensivize, incentivize? Just short here to say what the round table of companies is. It's a forum that gathers um, uh, stakeholders concerning the rare disease uh, um, uh, people, also people from, uh, um, from the Commission, the European Commission and the Parliament. And this is uh, 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 taken out of the, the, uh, some of the statements. Um, and um, what I would like just to jump to here is that we have constantly a discussion of how to actually um, um, perform, how to uh, develop the develop the the regulatory system and to point out the weaknesses of the regulatory uh, uh, systems. And these are some of the questions that we were um, talking about. I don't have the results for this yet, but it was we're talking about. I just show the last one here uh, because we are um, seeing and it will come in the near future. This is the new kind of products. The, um, the advanced therapeutic medicinal products and like the gene therapy. And the question is if our regulatory systems actually is um, uh, enough, um, developed enough for taking care of, of this. We are not sure it is. So this is the last one. Um, in today's world, science and technology offers an unprecedented chance to address the unmet needs of people with rare diseases. But um, um, the objective is to unlock with determination so as leave no one behind in the access to these new treatments. And in the bottom, you can see the websites to 
Eurotis, um, where you can find uh, the position paper and a lot of other um, politics and positions of uh, your, your, the European um, rare disease community. Thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one question before we have a coffee break. Um, so, thank you for that presentation, Kevin Alderson from Boston University. Um, I can imagine, you know, groups like yours, there could be different focuses. One could be entirely independent with zero engagement with companies and, you know, maintain a fiercely independent stance. And on the other hand, I could imagine a, a group that uh, is so tightly bound to companies that they're almost, you know, a mouthpiece for the companies. And so. I wonder where you see the orphan drugs groups in Europe along that continuum, and, and what sort of processes do you use to maintain your, your independent voice in, in all of that process? <clears throat> when it comes to um, um, the relationships with the pharmaceutical companies, I think is that your mention. Um, I think it's a bit different in Europe than it is in, uh, in the US. Um, I'm not sure, but it's, it's my impression. Um, it's, um, it's a question that is uh, very much discussed in, uh, in, in Europe and uh, for European organizations. And um, we have um, developed very strict rules for how this um, cooperation um, should um, should be performed. Um, I also see some differences between um, countries in Europe. Um, uh, <clears throat> so in in, uh, in my organization in Denmark, um, we have um, introduced very strict uh, rules for, for doing this um, and um, um, maybe more strict rules that uh, you see in, uh, in, uh, in our European um, organization, especially for receiving funds uh, from, um, from pharmaceutical companies. Um, in this way, we are much more strict for instance, in Denmark, than in um, in, um, in in the European uh, organization, um, we see it as um, um, very important to have um, to have um, cooperation with all stakeholders when it comes to rare diseases, also the pharmaceutical companies. Um, but it's very important for us, and you can see it when you see this position paper, that we are not speaking the case for the pharmaceutical companies. We can understand the, the challenges that they made, um, and, um, uh, but, we are not, uh, but we are not speaking for them. Um, we can also see the, uh, the, the, the critical points that we can, uh, we can point at, and we are not very shy to, um, to do so. You can see that in, in the um, position paper. Um, it's, a delicate, um, it's a delicate situation, and it's especially delicate when it comes to um, developing the products. Um, it's the same small group of patients that is supposed to, um, to um, take part in, uh, in trials to try to make um, a company interested in, um, in, uh, in um, developing a product um, to, um, to uh, give um, uh, information to work together with a, a company to actually um, uh, make a, a product um, uh, to, to give results uh, to show that the product is actually effective. 
and after that to discuss with um, national authorities that they should pay for it. Uh, normally, patient or patient organization will uh, uh, not be able to do that. They will be looked as uh, uh, people that is, um, what you call it, they don't, um, um, they are not um, um, inhabil, what we call that, uh, yes, in, um, in, in discussing this product. And that is really a problem. It's really a problem because we are so small, we cannot have some people take um, part in development and have some other people from the same disease not doing it. So uh, it's a problem. Thank you very much.